Uh, hi everyone, I'm Mo Chen. I'm an assistant professor from the uh, Conflict School of Management, University of Minnesota. I teach the full-time MSBA uh, there, and uh, today I want to share with you some of the design uh, of the reinforcement the learning module in my course, MSBA 6460, that's the Advanced AI in Business Application. The reinforcement learning is about half of that uh, course. The other half is natural language understanding, things like transformer attention mechanisms. Uh, in the spirit of sharing, everything I use in that, uh, in that whole course is uh, open uh, in that uh, public repo, so feel free to take whatever you want from that. Uh, I should say everything except for the homework, uh, except for the homework design. Uh, and that's important for today because I want to share with you not only the topics I cover in reinforcement learning, but also the design of the assignment for the reinforcement learning module. So this morning I've been chatting with some folks here at the conference. Uh, there seems to be a perception that reinforcement learning is this, this, is this weird standalone topic in machine learning that is not a standard component of many MSBA curriculum design because it's kind of isolated with the other uh, components and also there's a perception that this is, this is a difficult concept or a difficult topic that students may not be able to get. I'm here to try to convince you that number one, we can do it, number two, your students can do it, and number three, there are many organic and productive connections between reinforcement learning and other parts of machine learning. So this morning, Andy gave the talk in terms of AI and metaverse, and he quoted uh, Arthur Clarke. I also happen to be a big fan of sci-fi and Arthur Clarke. He has another very famous saying, which basically says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So part of, the design, part of the design philosophy of this MSBA 6460, and especially applied to reinforcement learning, is that I want to demystify the magic and going back to the first principle and review that this is actually just technology, and in many cases, not that advanced. So I want to first show you the key topics I cover in reinforcement learning, and I want to do more than just show you the list. I want to justify the things I put in here and things I choose to leave out. So I'll start with the basic concepts, sort of show them the basic terminologies or the basic languages that people use when they talk about reinforcement learning. So things like agent, environment, reward, state, action, et cetera. This is important at the beginning because if you think about it, students come to this class without any prior knowledge of reinforcement learning. And the language here is quite different from the language of other kinds of machine learning, like supervised or unsupervised. This is specifically about making decisions, taking actions, not making predictions or design or discovering patterns. So it's important to start with the first principle and the basic concepts. And I sort of dive into a bunch of examples to illustrate what is an agent, what's environment, uh, agent environment action are usually more straightforward. It's given by the problem definition or the problem setup. Reward and state are much less obvious. And I give examples in terms of if you choose the, if you design the reward in a wrong way, it can significantly hinder how your agent learns to perform different actions in the environment. So I give examples to show that. After that, I sort of spend a non-trivial amount of time talking about this fundamental trade-off in reinforcement learning, which is exploration versus exploitation. And I make a big deal out of this. I tell, even tell my student that it's okay for me if you forget everything else I teach you in reinforcement learning, I want you to take away this, this one trade-off, which is exploration versus ex exploitation, because it goes way beyond reinforcement learning. It has implications for many, many other domains or many, many, many other problems. After we are done with the basic concepts and the setup, we start talking about two foundational models or two foundational types of problems in reinforcement learning. One is multi-armed banded model and the other is Markov decision processes. Uh, usually the banded model is perceived to be simpler than the Markov decision process because state is not really playing any role in the banded model, whereas it plays a crucial role in Markov decision processes. So we start with a simple one and then go into the more complicated ones. In the multi-armed banded model uh, uh, module or the session, I teach them about the two classic types of solution strategies in reinforcement learning. Again, as far as terminology goes, the action value methods and the gradient-based methods as two critical solution strategies in reinforcement learning also go beyond multi-armed banded models. But they are best illustrated in the, con in the context of multi-armed banded models because of the simplicity of the model itself. So I talk about things like greedy algorithms, epsilon greedy, upper confidence bounds, 
Uh, many of you may have even used this approach in your own research, and then talk about gradient-based approach, policy gradient, things like that. Then I move on to talk about, I spend about two or three sessions on Markov decision process, because this is a more powerful model, but it's also necessarily more complicated, necessarily more complicated. You have to keep track of how your action changes the state of the environment, and also how the changing state of the environment affect the subsequent actions you want to take. So here, I really take my time and introduce the solution strategies you can use under different assumptions of what you know about the environment. So for instance, if you, if you, for simple tasks like playing a game, and especially if the game is relatively simple, you have complete information about the environment, about how states change between each other. Then you can use sort of more traditional uh, deterministic approach like dynamic programming. So this is policy iteration, value iteration. I want to give uh, a clarification here that whenever I talk about policy iteration, value iteration, students get this feeling that this is so different from kind of the stochastic machine learning approach that they have been exposed to. Here is dynamic programming. It's talking about how state of the problem changes from one state to the different state and how you solve it with an iterative approach. But that's by design and that's intended. I want to give them the exposure to the other side of things. Not everything is a stochastic gradient descent on a neural network. This is also important to understand, especially when you have information about the environment. Because the benefit is that if you do, if you do are in a if you are in a position of using this approach, they have very good theoretical guarantees of giving you the optimal policy within finite time, things like that. And then obviously we also say that not every problem can be solved with dynamic programming. There are a bunch of situations in the real world where you cannot claim to have full information about the environment or have any information about the environment. So we also talk about Monte Carlo approach, basically learning by doing or learning from real experiences by basically trying to navigate your way through the environment. So, uh, and you know, once you start talking about Monte Carlo in the context of Markov decision processes, you will see many of the things that they learned from the multi-arm banded model lecture coming back into the into the Monte Carlo approach. So there's a counterpart of epsilon greedy, there's counterpart of UCB in the case of Monte Carlo approach. And finally, I spent one or two sessions on ad hoc topics. Specifically, I talk about two things. Number one, I give an introduction to something called temporal difference learning. If you have never heard about this, that's perfectly fine. The reason I wanna introduce this is perhaps more important to share here. The reason I wanna introduce here is that temporal difference learning is kind of the combination of dynamic programming and Monte Carlo in the sense that it try to take the best of both worlds. If you wanna use dynamic programming, you need to assume complete information about the, uh, about the world, which is unrealistic. But if you want to use Monte Carlo, you don't need to make that assumption, but it's extremely inefficient. I use the example of Super Mario when I talk about Monte Carlo, and the limitation of Monte Carlo is basically your Mario has to literally die a million times before your agent can learn something useful. So how do you learn something without assumption of the environment, but also reasonably efficiently? And that gives rise to temporal difference learning, which is a very important topic in reinforcement learning. It is a little bit technically more advanced, so I only give an introductory uh, discussion of it in the, in the ad hoc topics session. And then I start talking about a little bit of information about deep reinforcement learning because, you know, students are going to ask, why are we always learning classic methods of reinforcement learning? Where is the deep learning stuff? So I give some, some exposure to that, not a lot. And then I actually spend some time talking about AlphaGo. So I open up the, the, the Nature paper where the AlphaGo team published and I actually went through the design, of their, the design of that system. This serves two purposes. Number one, this actually gives students a very good feeling that even after three weeks or so, uh, which by the way, I should mention in the beginning, this entire course is seven weeks. Student meets 75 minutes twice per week. Half of that is natural language understanding. The other half, which is about three weeks, is reinforcement learning. So once I show them the AlphaGo paper, they would get a good sense of feeling that even after three weeks of learning, they will start to understand why the components of AlphaGo are designed the way that they do. Why do you need a policy network? Why do you need a value network? Why do you need something called Monte Carlo tree search to make decisions in the end? At the same time, I also highlight the non-trivial nuanced case specific design that the AlphaGo team has to put into the system. 
it's not as if you can just take some textbook solution strategy and start building AlphaGo yourself. You have to make a lot of adaptations. You have to make a little bit, you have to make a lot of small innovations here and there. So this example also gives them a sense of ways to go before they can build real world systems. It gives them some, something to look forward to. So this is kind of the entire topic design. And I wanna also show you how does this particular course and specifically reinforcement learning fits into the entire MSBA program. And the reason I wanna discuss this is that it has implication in terms of how the content is delivered and how the assignment is designed. So as I mentioned before, I'm from U of M and uh, the Carlson MSBA has three semesters, one year long. In the first semester, we do the foundational courses. So stats, intro to BA, programming, databases, business essentials. In the second semester, we do the deep dive, the advanced courses, but also number, nevertheless really, really important. So advanced machine learning, predictive uh, exploratory, causal inference, which Gord used to, used to teach, uh, big data, ethics, data privacy. Uh, in the third semester, we do what's known as a specialty course. Uh, that uh, might be more relevant for some domain, but not for others. Things like forecasting, optimization, and a very big experiential learning project. So my elective course, which contains natural language understanding and reinforcement learning, sits at the end of the third semester. The implication of this posi positioning is that I can teach reinforcement learning not in isolation, but try to connect it as much as possible with other topics that the students have already learned throughout their MSBA uh, uh, journey. So one thing that happened this year, which makes me really, really happy in terms of making connection, is that the two components of my course are now connected by ChatGPT, by the way ChatGPT <laughs> is learned, right? In all prior years, I had to somehow, I had to somehow be level with my student that natural language processing and reinforcement learning are two different domains. Not so much anymore. ChatGPT, part of the success, is attributed to the fact that we're using reinforcement learning with human feedback. Right? So now we, students can see from day one that principles and ideas from reinforcement learning can actually help you make better language models. And there's much more connections between just between NLP and reinforcement learning. Another uh, connection is between reinforcement learning and causal inference. And that goes behind the design of my assignment, which is what I wanna share with you next. So, the assignment I give for the reinforcement learning module is special in the sense that it is not just a repetition or practice of what they learn in class. This is designed to be a challenging assignment that actually push them outside their comfort zone. So this is an assignment that talks about something called cost-aware A-B testing. I'm sure you guys know actually a lot more about this than the students, so I can go a little bit quicker on this part. So here's the motivation, just in case you are not familiar with this, with this concept. So what the students have learned from their causal inference class before they come to reinforcement learning is that if you wanna do A-B testing in a simple setting, you would assign your potential subjects into different conditions based on some kind of predetermined proportions. Could be equal assignment, could be 20%, 80%, doesn't matter, but, it, but it's predetermined uh, uh, proportions. And I start to tell them that that could be problematic in practice. For instance, if you think about clinical trials, if, you, if in the process of testing people on different experimental conditions, you discover that some conditions are suboptimal or even harmful to people, should you still keep assigning people to that condition? Probably not, right? You wanna make the assignment process dynamic in the sense that as you discover the treatment effect, you also adjust how many people you assign to different conditions. So in, 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 in a different sense, subjects that you assign to different conditions, especially the less than optimal conditions, they bear certain costs because of your assignment. At the same time, you also cannot do away with assignment at, you know, completely. You have to make some assignment to each condition, even if some of those conditions turn out to be bad, because otherwise you won't be able to know whether or not they're good or bad. So this actually is a classic exploration versus exploitation trade-off. Exploration, because you have to assign some people to explore the quality of treatment. Exploitation, meaning you don't want to keep assigning people to the suboptimal or the really, really bad conditions. And they can, they can try to model this trade-off using multi-arm bandit model. At the same time, this is also not a standard multi-arm bandit model setup because we're talking about A-B testing. 
there is the extra consideration of causal inference and estimation that students have to keep in mind. That students have to keep in mind. So I'll give you much more on what does this mean and how do they incorporate this on the next slides. So what I look for in a reasonable solution, there is the basic setup. They have to do a correct setup, meaning that they have to tell me that they understand each arm here now means a treatment condition, and you're assigning people to a condition, meaning that you're pulling on an arm on a banded machine, simple stuff. And they need to be able to simulate the realized treatment effect for an individual by drawing a random number from a distribution. This is actually very, very simple because I give them sample code. They can literally just do the same thing. There's a bonus point here in my sample code because I was just demonstrating multi-arm bandit without inference considerations. I draw all the realized rewards from equal variance distributions. Here, if they choose to simulate different variances for different treatment conditions, it means that they have at least give some thought to the fact that different treatment conditions can have different underlying uncertainty in terms of reward. The really important thing I look for in the solution of this problem is that they have to give some consideration about estimation uncertainty and not just reward. Because the default solution of banded model just look at reward, average reward, expected reward. And if an arm has a higher reward than a different arm, you would go to that higher reward arm very simplistically. It doesn't even consider whether the reward distribution of these two arms are statistically significantly different. But that is a consideration in A-B testing. You can't just say that treatment A on average is higher than treatment B. They ha there has to be some level of statistical evidence that is significantly or meaningfully better. So they have to give that, they have to take that into consideration. For instance, they have to somehow built in to the solution of this problem some considerations of the standard error of treatment effect estimation. I intentionally, and this is what makes the assignment challenging for the students, I intentionally do not specify how they should do this. And I leave complete flexibility to the students in terms of figuring out how they want to incorporate the uncertainty in the estimation into their own solutions. This forces the student to think deeper and actually inspires a lot of innovative solutions that I want to share in about one, one or two minutes. The other benefit, the collateral, collateral benefit of not specifying how you should do this is that grading this assignment is very easy. Bad solutions are easy to spot. Every year I got about 10-15% of the students just don't come to my class because this is elective and their solutions are really easy to spot because they would just copy my sample code, change some variable names and submit to them. They don't even understand that this is actually a causal inference problem. So that's easy to catch. There will be also some students who didn't actually think this through. They thought the uncertainty just comes after I solve the problem. I would just assign people as usual and then I would compute some kind of standard error of my average treatment effect estimation after, after, uh, after the process. But that's kind of not the point. You wanna keep track of that as you assign people. So now I want to show you some of the solutions that students come up. Again, this is, the this is the part I'm really proud of the students because they came up with all of these solutions without any of my input, any of my instructions. So there is the relatively simple approach where you preset a significance level, let's say 5% or 1%, whatever you want, and you just start with random assignment, but you stop assigning to a condition if that condition false if that condition turns out to be statistically significantly worse than the current best condition, judging by this 5% level. This is one way of incorporating the uncertainty. There's another approach which actually is quite decent. This actually maps to somehow uh, to some of the practices that we do in research. So you can start with random assignment or equal assignment with a small batch of patients, small batch of subjects, and you would treat that almost like a pilot study and you will use the result of that to do sample size calculation. And once you have the sample size calculation, you will just assign people based on the, sam the calculated sample size. There's also approaches which basically try to modify how you compute the value of an action. Now, just in case you, you're not familiar with the uh, terminologies of reinforcement learning, in reinforcement learning, many times in order to solve some problems, you want to keep track of or calculate the value of an action, which basically tells you on average or an expectation how good it is to you to take this action. So obviously this is a very important concept to compute. You can 
manipulate how you compute this value of an action to incorporate other considerations, to incorporate other considerations. So instead of the classical solutions where basically you just compute the value of an action by taking average of the realized reward, here you can plug in the standard error or the measurement of uncertainty into the value of an action. So this is what the students came up with. Again, don't worry about the notation, I'll explain to you the intuition here. So this is the traditional calculation of a value of an action. The students, the most simplistic approach is just add the standard deviation to it. Why, the, why is this a good idea? Because if the standard deviation of a treatment is high, it means we, have, we, know, we don't know too much about this treatment. There's higher uncertainty. It would prop up the value of this particular treatment, meaning that you would explore this treatment more. You would assign more subjects to this treatment condition in the hope that you would get better estimates. If there's another uh, condition which already has a small standard error, you would comparatively assign fewer people because you already know the average effect of that treatment. So even this very, very simple solution, basically half a line of code in their solution can already give you some meaningful results. There's more fancy ones. For instance, you can sort of normalize the standard error by how many times you have already tried this approach, sort of give it a normalizing factor. Um, some other ones, these two I'll show together, that big square root plus the Q that is called UCB, upper confidence level. So what they do is they modify upper confidence level by either adding the standard error or multiplying the standard error. Okay? And there's also some students who says, who, you know, who says standard error is the only measurement of uh, uh, uncertainty? Confidence interval is also an, a measurement of uncertainty. So instead of adding standard error, let me add confidence interval. So these are all unsupervised innovative solutions that the students came up with. And there's also students who search for solutions online, and sometimes they use the solutions they found online. Most of the time, what I observe is that they try to come up with the solutions themselves. They try to play with my code, add in a few elements here and there just to see what happens. Okay, so let me quickly tell you some of the reflections I have with this assignment, with this design, and also some future improvements that I hope to make. Number one, as I mentioned several times already, this assignment is designed to challenge students. This is not a repetition practice of what they learn in class in a different context. They need a good understanding of both the causal inference and multi-arm bandit, and this is, again, by design to build that connection between these two topics. And they need to be a little bit creative to combine these two things and not just combine them in a superficial way, but actually combine, go into the algorithmic detail in terms of combining these two things. And there's no standard solution. I do not grade any of these solutions based on anything related to theoretical guarantees or computational efficiency. That's not the point here. If you are from a algorithm design perspective and looking at those innovative solutions that a student came up with, your reaction may be many of them are not that good. They're, they don't have very good regret bonds or whatever, but that's not my point. That's not my point. None of these students have any theoretical background in terms of analyzing reinforcement learning. And that's not usually our objective in the MSB program. We just want them to be able to think about this problem in innovative ways. So as long as they demonstrate any kind of thoughtful consideration of uncertainty into the solution, they usually get uh, the full credit for this assignment. And going forward, ideally, I think what I can do is make this entire assignment into quote unquote a competition. And I believe the next presentation might even be talking about this specifically. So meaning that I can create a simulation environment and they don't have to simulate any reward. They basically just act as the agent to submit strategies, to submit strategies in terms of how to do the assignment. That way, not only can I measure uh, the innovativeness of their solution, I can also quantitatively measure the efficiency of their solutions. Not the assignment, do they all get the same data set to randomize it to two? So they don't, they, they have to simulate it. Yeah, there's no, there's no data set per se. Uh, they basically just simulate, let's say, 10 conditions, and every condition they have to randomly simulate a true treatment effect and the variance around that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually part of the reason why I think I can do better by standardizing that. I can create all of those data generation process myself so everybody has the same leveling playground. Yes, yes, yes. 
This is not a big deal right now because, as I said, I don't grade them on performance. I grade them on thoughtfulness. But if I want to grade them on performance, I can by standardizing the data generation process. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm not sure if I want to do this because efficiency is affected by many, many different factors. I don't know how much I want to penalize people who don't, who have an interesting thought, but the algorithm don't work out as fast or as good as others. But you know, this is something that we can, we can discuss. Yeah. So one more thing, this is my last slide. I will be remiss if I don't talk about ChatGPT. In my course, because it's advanced AI, it will be ironic if I ban ChatGPT. So I ask students basically, use ChatGPT all you want, but be aware of the risk. One student used ChatGPT to solve this assignment. This is a really good example of how the misuse of this tool gives you nonsense, nonsense results, nonsense uh, solutions. In this particular case, the student clearly didn't come to class at all. It didn't even understand that this is a banded problem. So it was saying that there's 1,000 states representing 1,000 patients. But obviously, patients are not states. Patients are data points or actions. So this is completely, even the problem set up is wrong. Nevertheless, by asking ChatGPT, ChatGPT was able to spill out really, really well-designed code to implement something called Q-learning. This is only a part of the code. It goes, on for, it goes on for an entire page. The code runs, it gives them results. It is not even close to being solving a problem because it's solving a different problem. So this is one example where if you don't understand what you're even asking, obviously you're not gonna get anything from this tool. So that's all something I want to share with this example. Thank you very much. Everything else is on GitHub. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so that's a really good question, and that's something I've been struggling with a little bit when it comes to reinforcement learning, because cost aware A-B testing is pretty much the closest you get in terms of business application. Uh, there is the third, you know, sort of a uh, 3,000 miles away dream of using reinforcement learning to make business decisions or strategic decisions, but I don't think there's any success stories so far. And if you think about strategic gameplay, that's where it excels, but that's different from you know everyday business decisions. One quick example yeah. Of yeah. 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 There's yeah. There's sequential recommendation, sequential recommendation that you can use reinforcement learning for. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think students have uneven exposure to recommender systems in our program, so I can't really talk about that. Yeah, but thanks for the thanks for the suggestion. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, thank you, yeah. thank you for the great questions. Thank you, Mo Chen.